morning, and, and uh, the mic's working. Uh, thank you, Sherrod. And uh, I, I see there's a very little opportunity for, for new converts in this room. <laughs> Everybody seems to be already on board, um, but we'll, we'll go ahead. So I've, uh, my disclosures are that I, I, I still use the Biomet system, which I designed, and uh, I'm also now a consultant for Exact Tech. We're going to um, compare uh, uh, resourcing and total hip replacement mo mainly by functional outcomes and durability. We'll also talk about wear and mortality a little bit. The other topics will, uh, I think, be covered by Mike. Um, so the problem we're trying to solve is cartilage loss. Uh, let's not forget that. And so why do we do this? Um, because we had ad inadequate materials. This is obviously a, uh, uh, not the solution that we want. Uh, even Charlie did resurfacing but didn't have the right materials. And um, so we've been struggling because of lack of materials. They improved already a lot, um, and, and they continue to improve to make new options available. So why do we, when we have these new materials, why are we still sticking to activity limiting stain, stems, unstable small bearings? We added this trunnion to Charlie's construct that makes things worse. We have bone loss, and we have ongoing femoral fra uh, shaft fracture problems. We still persist with this uh, compromised solution when we can do much better with modern materials. So uh, I would say if we mimic the, it's just common sense that if you mimic the hip closer, you're going to have a better outcome in any way you measure it, and that's what I'm going to um, highlight in this talk. Functional outcomes for total hip replacement are okay for old folks. The average uh, uh, total hip patient in the registries is 70 and they can get out of pain and walk normally at slow speeds. That meets the demands of most. I've certainly had 70-year-old-plus people who that didn't meet their demands, and our younger patients, for sure, it doesn't. The problem, of course, is still persistent instability. The problem of thigh pain, that's from Barron's and Lombardi's paper, moderate to severe, severe 3 to 5 percent. And then really this thigh pain problem is, is worse when people try to, be, uh, try to do impact sports. They limp at fast walking speeds, as Justin and, and others have shown, and the Mayo Clinic has published a long-term fracture rate uh, of these stems. I just became aware of this this year, this paper. 7.7%. It's pretty dramatic over 20 years. So needless to say, the functional outcomes of total hip replacement, no matter how you do that operation, are completely unacceptable to young patients. You've just created a ceiling over the top of your head, and you can never break through that unless you move on and do resurfacing, the better operation. A couple anecdotal examples about function. We all have heard about Bo Jackson, who had a total hip in Boston. They celebrated him because he had hit a home run at his first at bat, but he couldn't even be a designated hitter. He was a football and a baseball player, of course. He couldn't even play designated hitter well and retired after two seasons. He couldn't hit the ball effectively and hobble to first base. And as the Swedish registry in young patients predicts, he has had two additional revisions in 20 years totally unacceptable for young patients in this day and age. But we persist in doing this to young people. Let's look at Andy Murray. He had a little speed bump with arthroscopy. He had the right operation in 2019. Now, four years later, he's ranked 37th in the world in men's singles tennis. This is a real sport. This is not hitting a ball and hobbling to first base. And, and here's just an example that Sherratt shared to me that I thought was fantastic. I don't watch a lot of sports, but... That's Andy on the other side. I mean, it's absolutely amazing how that guy can move four years after resurfacing. I mean, look at him go and twist and turn and slide. I mean, it's just absolutely astounding. This was this year in the Australian Open. He beat that guy. And he actually drove him bananas here. And it's just about over. Dang, that's how it's got to feel if you're a total hip surgeon and you have an operation that doesn't allow you to actually help people and get them back to their normal function. But thanks, Sherrod, for that. That's anecdotes. We all love anecdotes. But here's the data. Now we're going to move into the data. I've, I have collected scientific studies that show an advantage in function with resurfacing over total hips in different ways we measure this. Well, there's 11 studies in the scientific lit literature. These are the studies that show total hips have a better functional outcome. Does anybody know a study that I've missed? They don't exist. There are no studies in the literature that show total hips have better function than total hip. There are studies that show equivalence because they just have set the bar so low that everybody can hop over it. There are no studies, let's repeat, that show total hips are more functional than resourcing, but there are 11 that show the opposite. So I think the, uh, the, the evidence is pretty strong and undisputable that resourcings function better. And this is from Barrick's study, which is one of my favorites. He showed a higher percentage of patients who return to their most favorite recreational activity. 
I mean, that's what it's all about, getting people back to what they want to do, not giving them some compromise and saying, you have unrealistic expectations. That's what the total hip guys do. So Pritchett did another interesting study where he just looked at preference. He did the operation, a total hip underwear on 300 patients. Ten years later, he had someone else query them, and 86% said they liked the resurfacing side better. Even the ones who forgot which one was which fingered the resurfacing as their better hip. And then there's numerous uh, um, gait studies, and basically the gait studies that, 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 show, that just walk at slow speeds show no difference. But then when you do what Justin does and what, what uh, Van Sassante's group do is when you, when you have people walk faster, then it becomes evident that at faster walking speeds, this is not even running, this is just fast walking speeds, people start limping, they don't load that leg. So uh, if they have a total hip, but they walk normally still if they have a resurfacing. So is it really a surprise that function is better when you mimic the natural hip? I mean, it just makes total sense, and now we have ample data that I continue to hear from total hip patients. Oh, my young patients can do everything. Total nonsense. They just don't read the literature. So now we're going to move into where. I, I'm going to skip toxicity, cancer, and allergy. I think Mike's going to cover that and we'll talk about mortality. So why did metal on metal bearings get into trouble? I believe it was mainly, there were no, numerous reasons, because trunnion corrosion of large bearing total hips were misinterpreted as metallosis from bearing wear. There were some metallosis cases from bearing wear if they're malpositioned, but most of this trouble was the trunnion. We were used to seeing trunnions in total hips, so we didn't think that was a problem. The metal bearing was novel, so we always blamed it on the metal bearing. With resurfacing, we know that that's not true because we, have, we don't have a trunnion, and so we see the isolated bearing wear failures, which are very rare. And Kunda Smet was really the first one that taught me, you know, what the problem was. Low coverage arch because of small components placed too steeply. These bearings wear at a very low rate, but if you put them, the Achilles heels, if you put them too steep and too anaverted, they'll go off the rails with edge loading wear. And that's what Kunda Smet first sort of figured out, and it was then reproduced in the lab by these guys. They just put them steep, and, and sure enough, they went into, into high wear patterns. Um, we took our data and actually found a safe zone. This is actually the only safe zone that I know of that's in, in hip arthroplasty that's validated. The Luanake safe zone, I think we've all come to, come to understand, is total garbage. It, 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 it never was a scientific paper. It was just a, a, an opinion paper with some numbers. Um, so this is, this is from, uh, from our study on, um, uh, on, on a safe zone. So basically what you see is in smaller sizes, the bearing sizes above, you got to put the, the cup flatter. On the bigger ones, you can put it up to 56. So there's no target position for a metal, metal resurfacing cup. It depends on the size. And we validated this with 2,500 additional cases with not a single wear failure. So this is a validated safe zone, unlike the Luanix safe zone. And here's the principle. Shallower, smaller components may be placed more, must be placed more horizontal to avoid edge loading and wear. The, the bigger cups are deeper by design, 165 on my 60 millimeter cup. So most of those, you're just going to, by chance, put them where, the, where they're not edge loading. The shallow cups, you're, you're, if you think you're putting them OK, you think you're putting them OK, but if you don't measure the angle and follow the rail, you're going to end up in an edge loading position. But all you have to do, all you have to understand is that you've got to put those flatter so you bring the wear patch away from the edge. And we have, we have a guideline. And I've done it. I don't have a wear case in 4,000 resurfacings now. Toxicity actually exists, but it's pretty rare. Um, allergy doesn't exist, in my opinion. We did a study on LCTs. Uh, I, I, that there's, it's, it's a hypothesis, and cancer has been debunked a long time ago. Mortality is another interesting topic that the total hip surgeons want to just try to forget as much as they can, but the data is overwhelming. Here are five studies in the registry. McMinn started it first. Of course, he's biased, and, and nobody wanted to believe him, but then Oxford, Kendall did it. It's in the Australian registry. Peter Brooks, Bannister. So there's five studies now. The, the Oxford study is the most well, the, uh, most well controlled, and it shows a 70% higher mortality at 10 years for a cemented total hip with in matched patients, and for uncemented total hips, it's 37% higher. So here's what Kendall matched: he propensity scored matched not only for age and sex and comorbidity, also for rurality and socioeconomic index, and he calculated for every 55 hip resurfacings done instead of an uncemented total hip, one life was spared over 10 years. So I calculated that Ronan Tracy has probably already saved 145 lives in his career. But the total hip surgeons just want to forget this stuff. They just pretend it doesn't exist. Here's the Australian registry data from, the, from a supplement they published. It's a pretty dramatic difference, but they only control for age and sex. Peter Brooks, in his experience, uh, controlled study at five years, 
Gordon Bannister at 18 years, a, a three-fold difference. So are we killing people with total hips? That's the first comment I get back. back. You know, people are kind of frustrated about this. Or is uh, hip resurfacing life preserving? Um, actually, there's data that shows that hip preserves, total hip replacement is slightly uh, life preserving, has a little mo lower mortality at 10 years. The thing is that resurfacing is even better. And uh, you know, here, are the, here are the numbers from the five studies. So finally, we like to talk about durability. And this is how we, Kaplan-Meier implant survivorship is how we measure it. Uh, the best study in the world literature that I can find is actually on an uncemented uh, ceramic on ceramic hip from Korea. So I congratulate Dr. Kim. He's got the best data in the world. Virtually 100% implant survivorship at 20 years. This is, this is truly unbelievable data and virtually 100% follow-up. So I put my current series, which, I'm, which has been submitted for publication next to that. It doesn't quite match up, I have to admit. Uh, slightly a lower uh, uh, long-term sur uh, survivorship. Not as quite as good a follow-up. I only got 70% of people to test their ions instead of 100% with CTs, but I have about uh, five times as many cases. So not quite as good. Kim is really the, the, the king, I think. But, but here's the other data from the major institutions of this country. Hospital for Special Surgery published 78% at 15 years. They lost about 20 to 30% to follow-up on that study, too. So it was really not a very good study, and the outcomes are unacceptable. Lombardi claims a 98% tenure implant survivorship with, with his study, but if you look at it, he has lost 20% to follow-up. He's lost, um, he, he doesn't tell you how many of his patients he does have follow-up are up-to-date, and he only has 18 patients at risk at 10 years. You can't claim 98% implant survivorship with a ceramic vitamin E cross-link poly uncemented total hip replacement with that kind of data. He, he, it, it's, a, it's a false claim. The Mayo Clinic has a good series. It's tiny. Also, don't tell you how many of their up-to-date, uh, how many of their follow-up are up-to-date. Young Hoo Kim stands out way above all other total hip replacements, and that's uncemented ceramic and ceramic, which no one in the U.S. wants to do for some reason. So uh, what about durability and resurfacing? These, these are 11 series now uh, from, from expert surgeon series that, that show uh, uh, reasonably good, so, and they're all young patients. The mean ages of these studies are about 50, 52, 53 usually. And uh, five of them have 15-year data now, um, which is pretty strong. So there's, there's lots of data out there. It's not just I that can do it or Derek that can do it. You know, a lot of people can do this and have shown it and demonstrated it. So here's my data. 17-year year data now. I've got 5,500-plus um, cases in this series, mean age 54. And interestingly, in, in uh, my hands, it doesn't really matter anymore, age, sex, diagnosis, or implant size. I do it on everybody, and the outcomes are exactly the same. 1% failure by 17 years. And here's my Kaplan-Meier curves. There was, there was a hybrid group and an uncemented group and a combined group. So at risk of 10 years, 2,700 patients, not 18 patients, 2,700 patients. At 15 years, I've got 900 at risk. So, so this survivorship number is valid. Lombardi's is not valid. Total hip replacement cannot meet this, meet, uh, uh, meet this bar. Here's some uh, further highlights from our study. For fracture rates down to 0.2%. That includes head collapses in the first year. Interestingly, the total 17-year fracture rate over my series is, this, this is not a Kaplan-Meier number, is 1%. Remember, the Mayo Clinic is 7.7%, but they're older patients, but it's quite a stark difference uh, in fracture rate between resurfacing and total hip over the long term. Even the short-term fracture rate is far lower than most total hip series. I don't have metallosis anymore since I've been using the rail uh, guidelines since 2009. Dislocation rate is low. The revision for dislocation rate, this is what the registries capture, vanishingly low and my mortality is shockingly low. Um, so this far surpasses all registry data and the NICE criteria for hip replacement, no matter how you slice and dice them, even the best three implants. Um, and it's generalizable. Catherine did a fantastic job. This is a hip at Hip International. This is not just a few expert surgeons. This is 27 centers, six implant systems. All the patients are young, under 50 years old. That's our real target, but I, as I said, I do in everyone. But in the youngs, when you can show the difference, and 20% implant survivorship at 22 years, the Swedish registry is the only other body where they have people under 50 with all diagnoses. And you can see that was published 10 years before ours, so it's not that different in time. Uh, but you can see there's a drastic difference in the implant survivorship between total hips in young people and resurfacing in young people. And here are the two survivorship curves, and this is if you kind of put them on top of each other. I kind of penciled this in. I mean, you don't need statistics. It's, it's so dramatic and so obvious. How can you argue with this? But resurfacing the registry doesn't look so good. 
So why is that? Well, the registries are uh, statistical instruments that are manipulated constantly. First of all, they, all, they don't exclude the ASR, which we all know is an absolute fiasco, the worst disaster in orthopedic implant history, and it gets counted in with the resurfacing. Um, but metal on metal total hips are excluded from the total hip data. So you know someone's got a strong bias if they're doing that. They know this. They know this. And then if you look at Allison Smith's study, who, who proselytized against resurfacing, said it was the worst operation ever. She's a statistician, I guess, for the, for the registry. Um, when I look back, you dig in her data, she didn't mention this, you make a calculation that the average volume of the surgeon who did resurfacing in British Registry was 2.6. Now I ask you, would you have an operation by a guy who's done, done, done 2.6 operations? I mean, that's absurd, and the fact that she didn't point this out and blasted resurfacing shows you the strong bias of the people who use the registry uh, to, to uh, denigrate resurfacing. So it's a combination of problems, contamination by a disastrous infant and comp contamination by amateur surgeons that brings resurfacing, uh, resurfacing data down in the registry. So I'm very down on registry data. Here is a registry that this is back to the same study where we had surgeons who actually knew how to do the operation. They weren't all super experts who'd done thousands, but they actually knew how to do the operation. They weren't just experimenting. And you can see the data was markedly different. Then this, there and there's this real uh, interesting new study that I've come across. So this is another manipulation of registry data. This time the Australian registry, they claimed the best three total hips were better than uh, the BHR. Well, a lot of problems. First of all, they weren't really young patients, which is really where we see a big difference, where resurfacing shines. Surgeon experience, again, is not addressed. They must have the data, um, but I bet it's the same as the British uh, um, registry, where there's a lot of... Uh, surgeons who do a couple a year and they contaminate the uh, registry with bad outcomes because they're inexperienced. Femoral fracture repairs are not counted on the total hip side. How many patients are dislocating but are unrevised? These are failures, but they're not revised, so they don't count. And then there's a whole issue that Paul Belay brought out about confounding variables. If you just take a big body of statistical evidence and pick a couple of groups that look the best, you may have just aligned all the confounding variables. So that's that's really gaming statistics is what that's called. It's not science. And these guys should be condemned for what they've done. Uh, besides that, the BHR patients the, uh, are, are likely way more active than we've already shown earlier in this study, so, they, so that bias is against resurfacing. We're taking a whole different group of patients. Because they can do more, they stress their implants more. And most interesting, mortality data was totally ignored. And they've got the data. They published it. It's right here. This is their mortality data. And you can lay this right next to their revision rate data and ask you, which would you choose? An operation that gives you 6.7% failure at 15 years, more or less, and a 6% mortality, or an operation where you have 3.2% failure but a 40% mortality. I mean, I think the choice is obvious. Why didn't they include that? It's such an important part of the uh, decision making. So what operation would you have? An operation that gives you better function, a lower dislocation risk, preserves your bone, lowers your 10-year uh, uh, all-cause mortality, and is most, more durable than most total HIPS uh, uh, studies published in the world. The only problem that's still holding surgeons back is this, or one of the main problems, is this metal fear factor. People just haven't gotten over this. They still blame resurfacing for all the total hip trunnion corrosion problems. But there's a couple group, groups of people who are tr working hard to solve this problem. We've got new implants that don't have cobalt chrome, so now it's time to rethink this idea and we can get over this metal fear factor and do the right operation for people. I think joint replacement surgeons worldwide need to learn how to do this and allow their patients to return to all activities, not just activities of daily living, and extend their lives. Thanks.